Good afternoon. Um, thank you all so much. It's wonderful to be here with Victory, an organization that holds a really, really special place in my heart. Like many of you, I went through Victory's candidate training and then Victory Fund was incredibly supportive when I myself ran for Congress in the early days in 1996 in Long Beach. Um, and I especially want to congratulate and thank Mayor Parker, who is coming up on her one year anniversary as president and CEO of Victory, and what a year it's been. I'm proud to be here representing the great state of California, where we've had quite a year too. <laughs> Equality California, along with our friends from the California Legislative LGBT Caucus, and we have Susan Eggman, who's the former caucus chair with us today, sponsored a record, a record number of pro-equality bills, and including bills working with Assemblymember Todd Gloria to make California the first state in the nation to guarantee gender-affirming, life-saving health care for our transgender youth in foster care. And across California, millions of voters cast their ballots for pro-equality champions in the 2018 midterm elections, the highest turnout since the 1970s, resulting in a pro-equality mega-majority in both of our Assembly and our State Senate. Working with Victory Fund, we elected my friend Ricardo Lara as the California's first openly LGBTQ <laughs> statewide elected official, making him soon the LGBTQ elected official with the most constituents in the country, a title currently held by our Los Angeles County Assessor Jeff Prang, who's with us today. We flipped seven congressional seats from anti-equality incumbents to pro-equality members, including Katie Hill, who will join Congressman Mark Takano representing us here in Washington. And Mark will be making a little more history of his own in a few weeks when he becomes chairman of the U.S. House Veterans Affairs Committee. So the state of our state is strong, and over the years, working with our openly LGBTQ leaders in the LGBT caucus of our legislature, we've passed the strongest statewide LGBTQ civil rights protections in the nation, making California a shining beacon to the rest of the country. We were the first state to pass comprehensive LGBTQ civil rights protections that include gender identity. We made California the first state in the nation to protect LGBTQ youth from so-called conversion therapy. We modernized California's outdated HIV laws and banned the gay panic and trans panic defenses from being used in our courts. It's easy to understand why people so often look to California and, the, and assume that our state has always been a blue liberal bastion. Not so. It was just eight years ago that we had a Republican governor. Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger may seem great by today's standards, and he certainly has evolved over the years, but he was not a progressive governor, and his record on LGBT equality was mixed. In the 1990s, we had Governor Wilson, whose, whose anti-immigrant rhetoric was competitive with that of Donald Trump's. And before that, he represented California in the United States Senate where he earned a reputation for his conspiracy theories about gay people, feminists, labor leaders, and welfare cheaters. Let's just say he was no Kamala Harris. And I'm sharing with you this because while we have indeed accomplished quite a lot in California, we are not just an example of what many, what many other states could be if only their voters were more progressive. California is a great example of what other states will be. Already, we see states like Nevada, where Equality California will be launching our Battle Born Equality program in the next few months, and Oregon, turn more and more progressive. There are states once written off as deep red, like Arizona and Georgia and Texas, becoming truly competitive for progressives. Traditionally purple states like Colorado and Michigan are electing LGBTQ folks to statewide office. As Mayor Parker likes to say, 
America needs us. And California is a lesson that with strong LGBTQ leaders, every state indeed can become one that respects, protects, and celebrates LGBTQ people and the diverse communities to which we belong. The second misconception people make about California is that we're done. You come and drive through West Hollywood and San Francisco and Hillcrest, and it seems like LGBTQ folks are doing great. But that perspective is deeply rooted in a bit of affluence and privilege. We've accomplished a lot in California, but still, too many Californians don't experience full lived equality. The long-term effects of discrimination and lack of acceptance have left too many LGBTQ people in our state way behind. By every measure of health and well-being, health care coverage, poverty rates, homelessness, where four out of 10 homeless youth are LGBTQ, rates of poverty, interaction with the police, every measure of health and well-being, we're at the bottom. And those of us who are women, are living with HIV, are members of communities of color, members of immigrant communities, or the transgender community, rank at the very bottom of almost every measure. Many of the institutions to which people turn in times of need or crisis, schools, healthcare providers, faith-based organizations, and even law enforcement, at best, lack the cultural competency to support LGBTQ people, and at worst, are, only ho are openly hostile to our community. No, we're not done. Not as long as our young people are facing bullying and harassment in our schools, and that's why we launched the safe, our Safe and Supportive Schools initiative to make sure that every child has a great public school where they're able to learn and grow and are treated fairly and with dignity and respect. Not as long as transgender women of color face violence in our streets. Not as long as immigrant communities face the threat of deportation. And not as long as parents with black children have to sit them down and explain what happened to Botham Jean, John, or Trayvon Martin, or Tamir Rice. <laughs> Not as long as women face a culture of sexual harassment in the workplace, and a man who is accused of sexual assault can be confirmed to our nation's highest court. To those who might say, well, those aren't LGBTQ issues, they're wrong. Our tagline at Equality California is until the work is done. So we will continue to work with our incredible elected leaders like Congressman Mark Takano, Assembly members Todd Gloria and Susan Eggman, LA County Assessor Jeff Prang, all of, from who you, all of whom you're about to hear from. And we will keep striving to create a world that is healthy, just, and fully equal for all LGBTQ people until the work is done. Thank you very much. Please turn your attention to the screens for a short video. Hi, I'm Katie Hill, and I'm the newly elected Congresswoman from California's 25th Congressional District. I'm so proud to be part of the Victory Institute family and to be standing with you as one of more than 600 openly LGBTQ elected officials across the country. I'm so proud to be a Californian and proud of our history in electing so many LGBTQ leaders to office. I'm especially proud to be the first LGBTQ woman elected to Congress from the state of California. Because of these LGBTQ elected officials, California is leading the nation with anti-discrimination laws that are unparalleled across the country. I hope those of you not from California can learn from our work here, and I know that many of you from more conservative parts of the country face additional hurdles in securing true equality. I hope you enjoy the International LGBTQ Leaders Conference, and I can't wait to be with you in Washington, D.C. soon. Please welcome to the stage our moderator and star of Queer Eye, Karamo Brown. Hello friends, how are you all doing? Has the day been treating you all well? Good, 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 good. Look at this amazing panel we have coming up here. Can we just give them a round of applause really quickly? So to begin, California has 
more openly LGBTQ elected officials than any other state in the nation, 105 in total. Give it up for that. The result is California has among the most progressive laws when it comes to LGBTQ equality. The conversation, this conversation aims to uncover how California became a leader in LGBTQ representation and LGBTQ equality, and what elected officials in other states can do to build from California's success. I want to go ahead and first introduce my panel very briefly. I'm going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves a little bit more. But please, everyone, give a round of applause for our panel. First of all, we have Assessor Jeff Prang, um, Los Angeles County, um, for the Los Angeles County. We have California State Assembly member Susan Eggman. We have California State Assembly member Todd Gloria. And we have U.S. Representative Mark Takano. Okay, so I would love to have each of you start um, by giving you an opportunity to briefly introduce yourself. And also, I have a very, very important question. You must also tell me who your favorite Queer Eye castmate is. <laughs> I'm joking. It's Jonathan, right? The, none of them watch the show. They're like, I don't know who you're talking about, but it's OK. Um, you're busy. You're busy. You're busy. Um, so please, go down the line if you would introduce yourself. Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, my name's Todd Gloria. I, I have the honor of representing the 78th Assembly District uh, in California. That's coastal San Diego County. Pretty much if you've been to San Diego, you've been to my district. Um, I uh, w just was elected my second term uh, in the legislature uh, and uh, joined there about two years ago after serving two terms on the San Diego City Council where I served as council president and even served as mayor of San Diego for a short while. I'm really glad to be here today and great to see you all. <laughs> Uh, and my name is Susan Eggman, and I represent the 13th Assembly District, which is in Stockton, that you may not have been to before, if, you've, <laughs> if you have visited California. Um, and, and unlike Todd, I don't represent Coastal California, and one of the things that you may or may not know is that uh, some of us say that well, there's two Californias. There's Coastal California, and there's Inland California. Uh, so I represent Inland California, which previously has been very red, and we are doing very best uh, to make it blue. I served at, uh, and I ran after coming to the Victory Fund Institute uh, training program for Stockton City Council in 2006, becoming the first openly LGBT person uh, from the Oregon border all the way down to Los Angeles. And then, uh, and have, uh, I've completed my third term on the state assembly, um, beginning my fourth, um, and I'm very happy to be here with you today also. My name is uh, Jeff Prang, and I'm the Los Angeles County Assessor. I was asked to be here to add a little bit of excitement into this proceeding in a way that, <laughs> in a way that can only be done by the LA County Property Tax Assessor. <laughs> and, I, and I probably have to stick to it. I actually don't do taxes. We just do appraisals. Uh -huh. um, the tax collector does taxes. But I've, uh, was, I just got reelected to my second term um, and was uh, installed this past Monday. Um, and I as Rick Zabur had indicated during his opening remarks, at least for the next three weeks, I represent the largest constituency of any LGBTQ uh, elected official, I think, in the world. Um, and I've, uh, and I've, I've learned that that plus six dollars will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Um, prior to being an assessor, I served for five terms uh, as mayor and council member in the city of West Hollywood. Uh, so, my name is Mark Takano. I represent the 41st Congressional District of California. It is also Inland California, part of a region known as the Inland Empire. Uh, actually, my, my PAC, my leadership PAC, is known as the, the Inland Empire Strikes PAC. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it's good. Um, so, uh, my favorite queer eye. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So you're the only one whose name I know on, yeah. on that show. So, guy, yes. Worry. So I, I binge watched it on, I think, uh, Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> it was an assignment from my comms director who thinks, you know, you're the, ba you're the best. And she oh, says, okay. get a photo with him because it's going to get you a lot of likes on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, you know, I saw you go to Gay, Georgia. 
there's actually a place called Gay Georgia. So you know that show. And it's like, you know, it's kind of like what Riverside and probably Stockton was like. Uh, I mean, it was, it was very moving, the, 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 the homecoming and all of that. I was just, so I really watched that. I'm just trying to prove I appreciate it. that. No, I appreciate this. I eat my words now, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. I like the guy who does the cooking, who kind of straight acting guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> but the one who does the hair, she's fabulous too. Yes, yeah, she is. Yes, yeah, yeah, she yeah. is. So, um, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't start out perfectly gay. I started out, you know, I met Jeff, well, Jeff Prang is part of the story. So, uh, in 1990, I won my first political office, the Riverside Community College Board of Trustees. And I just kind of slipped in there. Uh, nobody knew much about me, but I won my first election. And 1990 also coincided with, you know, the, the census, and they, they redrew the districts. And I had a, a congressional district that I was originally going to run for the assembly, but uh, there was a stronger candidate running for the, for the assembly. But anyway, I, I, to speed the story up, um, I, I ran for Congress in 1992 at the age of 31. And I, I wasn't an out candidate. I was just a candidate. Um, and I almost won. I was like 1,200 votes up. And I can't remember if it was 92. It was, I think it was the 92 year. I ran into Jeff Prang at a Victory Fund uh, event. I was meeting gay donors, but I wasn't like, I was on the down low still. And Jeff Prang was like, going, oh, oh, my God. We got another openly gay. I said, well, we're not openly gay quite yet. And it's like I went home thinking, oh, Jeff Prang is going to tell everybody, you know. Uh, <laughs> And he did. He told everybody. So it's like, because <clears throat> this was in Jeff's twink days. He was a little like twink. Uh, in his day. So he was. Jeff was a, like, he was a hot twink. So, um, so uh, uh, it's true. So anyway, the long story short, I, I end up. I ended up losing after they, you know how they count the ballots and they got more Democratic? In those days, they counted the ballots and they got more Republican. So I lost my 1992 election by 500 votes. And everybody says, you got to do it again. You got to do it again. And I was like the top candidate in 1994. And we didn't know about wave elections in 1994, so I would lose that election by 17 points. And then it would be like another, you know, 17, 18 years before I would have another chance to run. Uh, and in... Uh, 2012, you know, I won my election by 19 points, uh, my first election. So, uh, but what's instructive is that 1994 was also a year when Pete Wilson was running Proposition 187, and I voted on the Board of Trustees to oppose it. And it was probably, I probably would have lost even if I voted for it, but uh, I set a long lifetime record of trying to be on the right side of issues and standing up for the right thing. And then I stood up for immigrants. I stood up, I stood against the idea we were going to deny public services to them, which is what Prop 187 did. And lo and behold, Riverside County changed over time. The electorate of California changed. But I, the story is, is that California, progress is never on autopilot. Progressivity is never an autopilot. It is something that we've had to fight for the whole time. And just to highlight this, in 2008, just four years before I would run in 2012, Riverside County delivered a heck of a lot of votes for Proposition 8. So it's a socially conservative area. But I ran for office in 2012 also knowing that my county, even as they voted for Prop 8, they voted for Barack Obama. They voted for Barbara Boxer. They voted for others. So they, there was a mixed, a mixed feeling. We were going through a kind of transition. So I know that there's people in this room who have won local office in Arkansas. That was the first step. I won local office. And so you're, you're choosing not to, to play it safe and try to be politically successful in an urban area. You're going home. You're going, place, going back to places like gay Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, and whatever town it is that you live in Arkansas. And so, because being authentic is not just being true to being, being LGBT in the open. It is also about being true to where your home is. 
and what community you're committed to. Uh, and uh, trusting that building relationships over time. Uh, it's not the quickest route. It's not the quickest route to success. But it feels good uh, to have actually lost my election for the right reasons and to now have an electorate that supports the agenda that I fight for in Washington uh, because they trust me, they know me. Uh, they've gotten to know me over 18, 20, actually 22 years. 22 years I served in local office. And I really believe that that is, you know, an important training for, for everyone. So anyway, uh, my favorite, my, my favorite, uh, me. Queer Eye. Thank God. You. <laughs> I think you had to do Queer Eye for the queer guy too. <laughs> you don't need it, you don't need it. Um, well, first of all, give it up to our panel again. Thank you so much for them, for being here. Um, Representative, you said some amazing things that bring me to a, a point that I want to bring up. Assembly members Gloria and, Eg um, Gloria and Eggman, we talk about California being in the lead on equality issues. In what ways legislation, policies, laws is California leading, especially as it compares to other states in the nation? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I would say just about every way. Um, and I don't, I don't mean that in any kind of disrespectful way, but I mean, we are, we are a community of 40 million people. Um, and thereby, I mean, just because we're so large, I think things come before us and, and we have had a history of this. Um, and when you, when, and I think people are gonna talk about this, it feels like now that we're doing cleanup. Um, and I think one of the ways in which we lead is that when there is an LGBT bill, LGBT members have to fight for it because all of our colleagues and straight allies wanna do it first, so they can, they can be the best um, ally, which is fantastic. Um, so I think that is one of the ways in which we're leading. It's not just us, it is our allies that we have built relationships with, and I think, I think, I hope we all talk about that. It's the relationships that we've been able to develop. It's the networking we've been able to do with, with Victory Fund, with Equality California, with all the other um, uh, agencies that, that are in place to do this. It is the, um, and I think when we talk about things from a place of dignity and relationship, it just makes it all better. Uh, when I look back at um, 1999, the first state to pass marriage equality, well, domestic partners at that time. And then we see where that went. Um, when we do things like ban conversion therapy for minors, we see where that goes. Uh, it, it does go across the country. So in those kinds of ways, I think uh, we are leaders as far as trans issues. This year we did the, uh, last year we did the gender neutral bathrooms. That if it was a single stall, it's gotta be gender neutral. Things that just make sense. And I think the more you can um, partner with your allies and also find ways to build coalitions within those allied groups. You don't have to be the sole messenger. You can be out there, but you don't have to be the sole messenger. And I think that is what we see building across the country. And I would agree with everything that my colleague said, and you can see we like each other because we're sitting close together on the couch. He made me. <laughs> I bathed in everything today. <laughs> Um, I, I would amplify just, um, you know, our cup runneth over in California, and actually maybe we can d uh, demonstrate this here. How many of you all are a California elected official, out elected official? Um, we are, thank you, and thank you for running, and congratulations on, on your elections as well. We have the largest uh, legislative uh, LGBT caucus uh, in the United States. We have eight members. Um, and I think one of the ways that we're leading is the diversity. We have four senators, four assembly members, four men, four women. Uh, we don't have a trans person yet, but that's going to change in the not too distant future is my, my strong prediction. Um, we are a majority uh, caucus of color. Uh, and so there are a number of ways that we increasingly are representing uh, the diversity of a very diverse state. And I think that allows us, us to talk about issues that are outside of maybe some of the more uh, top line uh, issues within our community. I mean, obviously we have been blessed to have marriage equality and to move on from some of these historic fights and really pushing down to a more granular level kind of issue and really talking about the intersectionality that we know so many of us live. I think for a long time I felt I had to check my race at the door when I'd come to an LGBT event because we just didn't talk about that stuff. And being able to go into rooms now and not be seen as a weirdo by talking about immigration as an LGBT issue. Uh, this is where we're at now because of the diversity of the caucus, because of the work that so many of you have done as community activists. And so um, I like our diversity of our caucus, the size and, uh, of our membership, and the fact that by the hands that went up that we have a farm team of folks who when Susan and 
and I finish in the legislature, uh, we'll have more folks following on after us to continue to push issues that are exclusively LGBTQ, uh, but issues that over uh, uh, go beyond and intersect. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Rick Zaburr, by the way, if you want to know how we're leading, Equality California is one of the ways that we are leading. This organization is a tremendous partner for our caucus in getting things done. But Rick mentioned the issue that's my personal passion, which is housing and homelessness. And in this year's budget, we know that our children are overrepresented uh, when it comes to homelessness. And in this year's budget, working with Susan and a number of our colleagues, Phil Ting, our budget chairman, a half a billion dollars for homelessness in California, pushed down to cities for grants to get people off the streets. That is a California issue, but it's also an LGBT issue, and this is one of the ways that we're leading. That's great. Now, Assessor Prang, um, in what ways would you say that California is leading at the local level? California has, I think, for decades led at the local level by, by adopting, you know, local ordinances were adopted at the local level, whether it be on uh, domestic partnership or transgender rights, um, that eventually became state law. And there's a real history in California of activism, grassroots activism by municipalities, by school boards, trying to uh, push the entire state forward. And, we, and California does it on a, a, a range of issues, not just LGBT issues. I know that my own city of West Hollywood passed the very first ban on, on handguns uh, back in the uh, uh, mid-1990s. And I think there's a lot of leaders, particularly in the LGBT community, who see the opportunity to create a, a template uh, for other communities to build on that eventually will become state law and uh, hopefully in many cases of federal law. Correct. Um, I love that you talk about that template because that's true, you need that template. And Representative Takano, you have talked about from your history of running back in the 90s until now, how do you see that messaging has played an important role in making sure that we're creating a template? And what is that messaging that maybe others can implement? Well, um, you know, it's interesting, in what I didn't explain in 1994, uh, when we had the Newt Gingrich red wave that just overcame the country and we lost the Congress, the Democrats lost the Congress, um, you know, it was, it was considered acceptable by Republicans to send out a mailer uh, that was lavender or pink, and on the front of this mailer, it, it it said, it, it had um, uh, a picture, I think, of me, and it said, is, is Mark Takano going to be a congressman for Riverside? And then you open it up, or San Francisco. And then on the back, it said, he supports the, not just the, H, the, whole, the human rights campaign, he said, it's, he supports the radical agenda of the homosexual human rights campaign. Now, they didn't, say, I call me gay, they just, they just, but you could see in the, the design, you know, it was all by implication, you know, it, it, it was a, a homo, frankly, a homophobic campaign, and that's one example of what happened. And the funny thing, in 2012, I would get questions from the media, how the media, so the media was very focused on, is it true, in 1994, is it true that you are? And I didn't play it I didn't play it straight. I mean, forgive, forgive the, the uh, expression. I, you know, I said, well, this is just my opponent's way of, of trying to deflect attention from the fact that he was in the car with a prostitute and tried to run away from the police, um, which was true. Um, so that was sort of the messaging that was going on between the two camps. And, uh, uh, but by, you know, I, I basically come out by the end of the 90s. But by 2012, we were trying very trying very, very, uh, you know, we, we were trying very hard to get the press to focus on that I was gay, because uh, we, we knew that it would help us raise money. But they didn't really care that I was gay at that point. Uh, they, they cared more about what was the difference between then and now. That was more, when the media did focus on it, it's like, well, what was it like to run in the early 90s and what's it run to now? And I said, well, the difference is that I'm trying to get people to focus on that I am gay, and then I was hiding that I was, or we were trying different clever ways of messaging. Um, it seems to me that in large parts of the country, uh, it's become less and less relevant. I mean, Katie Hill did not win in San Francisco. You know, Susan Eggman did not win in San Francisco. Or even 
frankly, I mean, really it began, I give a lot of credit to San Diego with um, Christy Kehoe. Christy Kehoe was the first one that gave me hope. And, it, and San Diego was not known as a liberal bastion, but, but, we, but you, know, if you dig deep enough, you know that there was a strong Hillcrest community that was the basis for Christy Kehoe's first success. But you know, to see her win was actually for someone in Riverside. Like, I could, I will, I'll keep plugging away in Riverside. So it's not so much the message, I, I would say the messaging has changed because the times have changed. But really what's important is the substantive relationships that you begin to build, the, the community service that you begin to do, the, the work that you do in your own communities. That, that's really, you, you get that down and the messaging is gonna, is gonna kind of flow uh, according to the circumstance, right? But I would say that LGBT uh, status as an issue is less and less. I mean, on the Palm Springs City Council, We've got an L, a B, a G, and a T, all on the same city council. How about that? That's amazing. So, I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit, and I'm going to open this up for you all, because I know you said, and I'm going a little bit off script, that messaging is not as important because it is about action, and I do believe that. You show up to your communities, you let them know who you are, and you let them see the work that you're doing, and of course they're gonna be engaged. But we also know that when we turn on the news right now, um, for many individuals who are not in the state of California especially, you see messaging that is directly going against us, similar to what you said where you opened up that postcard and there was uh, your name saying you support a radical, you know, HRC gay agenda, um, and that, a lot of people do believe that. A lot of those individuals who we are working in their communities, they're seeing us every day, they still believe that we somehow are pushing this radical gay agenda. And I think for a lot of young individuals who are getting involved and who are wanting to go into politics or wanting to support um, LGBTQ elected officials, they don't truly know how to fight against that messaging without being divisive seeming as if they're upset, seeing if they're talking from a place of trauma. So with all of you have won, I would love to hear what is your advice on how to handle that? Um, I'll say, so I had, so I ran for council the first time in 2006, right after George W. had won, uh, who seems so good now, uh, with this idea <laughs> that we're gonna take back our country one city at a time. Um, and I like to think that's happened. That has happened over the course since 2004 when he won, but we find ourselves in this place again. Uh, so I ran for assembly in 2012, won, and my sexual orientation uh, wasn't an issue. And I don't think uh, Christina's still here from New York, but I'll never forget every time they wrote about me in the paper, it was out lesbian, Susan Eggman, out lesbian, Susan Eggman, until the day after I turned 50. And it was Eggman, 50. I'm like, ah! <laughs> lesbian! Susan Eggman, lesbian! <laughs> my brother, my friends all call me, ah ha ha, Eggman 50. Um, but I, the sexual orientation didn't come up a ton. This year, in 2018, for the first time, I had, in addition to a Republican challenger, a Democratic challenger who ran to the far right of me. Um, and the their opening salvo with a big fundraising invitation is we need to bring traditional values back. We need a traditional value candidate. We need somebody with family values. And it went out, this is 2018, in a democratic campaign. And the, the rebuke was swift. And it didn't have to be, they asked me what I thought. I thought, hmm, I, I, said, I, said, I didn't know we were still in the 1950s. Um, <laughs> But the rebuke from the media and from everybody else was swift and strong and, you know, he didn't make it out of the primary. And the supervisor who sent that out, it was a county supervisor who sent it out on his behalf, I think is not going to run for re-election. So I think in some ways our work speaks for itself. And that if you show up and you have relationships and you speak truth to power and you do not hide and deny who you are, and if you are there for people, people will be there for you. I think that's one of the things we have to learn. We have to trust that, that if we show up for people and they know it, they are gonna show up for us. 
Now, this question for everyone. Um, what strategies have you used to pass LGBTQ inclusive legislation that could be applicable in less blue states or, city, or cities, maybe even in a purple or red state or city? Is a question? Sure. We'll go for it again. Um, what strategies have you used to pass LGBTQ inclusive legislation that could be applicable in a less blue state or city, maybe even in a purple or red state or city? And I forgot to say another thing that the guy said too when he got called out. Then they start calling me a fake victim. Fake victim. Fake news. Fake victim. That was terrible. It was even worse. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> You know, I've had the, uh, the 50, good fortune of, of growing up on the west side of L.A. to West Hollywood, and we don't really have to deal with the... I've never had to deal with issues of discrimination in any of my campaigns. Um, but the one thing, as I, and I want to kind of repeat what I said earlier, the one obliga special obligation that I think I had, I think my colleagues when I was on the West Hollywood City Council have, and I think every LGBTQ uh, elected official in the state of California has, is we recognize that we're in a somewhat privileged place. We really don't have that many campaigns anymore where you see that sort of, I mean, they happen, but not like they do in other states. Um, and I think that we all feel a special obligation to ensure that we provide a good example, that we provide leadership on policy, whether it be administrative policy or legislative policy, going back to what I mentioned earlier, creating those templates, say we've done it here, we've gone through it all, learn from, uh, from us, and then supporting organizations like Equality California and the Victory Fund who provide that sort of expertise and that, that sustenance that, that those folks in other states that may be having those challenges that we, uh, we don't need to endure as much in, in California. And I think that's what's really important about California as it relates to uh, uh, the rest of the nation. Well, um, so I'm old enough to have been in, on, on the Board of Trustees at Riverside Community College before there was marriage equality. And there was, it's kind of amazing to think that there are young people who are gonna have a hard time remembering back when uh, these things didn't exist. But the, the goal of, of many lo local governments at the time was to um, provide domestic partnership uh, benefits uh, to their employees. And so if you were a member of the city council, if you were a member of a local school board, uh, they, if you were if you were attuned to what could you do to help the LGBT community move forward, um, you you could figure out oh let me do what I can with what I got. So if you think there if you think you're a member of an insignificant legislative body, a city council or even a water board, you're wrong. There's always something that you could be doing um, if you begin to build allies and a coalition. And it just so happened it was the teacher, the, the professor's union, the, the California Teachers Association president, who said, did you know that, uh, that uh, the, the uh, domestic partner's rights are negotiated in contracts? And that this is something that you could ask the chancellor uh, or the president of the district to do. Uh, and I had a conversation as one of the five board members uh, <clears throat> with the administrator. I said, I'd like to see us make progress on that. And when you're one of five, that's pretty significant. And so that was the beginning of, of, of a process. And this is you know, several years prior to the idea that marriage equality would ever become a reality. But you know, these are the strategies, that if you, specific strategies. There's always some of that. If you're a member of school, a school board, gay, LGBT people on school boards, incredibly important in, in, in certain parts of our country. You know, there, there are trans kids that are coming out. There are LGBT kids. I mean, there's the, like, lesbian, gay, bisexual kids are coming out earlier because of the media environment, but they're coming out in places where the local political infrastructure or social infrastructure doesn't support that. So you being on a school board can be incredibly important if you're willing to step into the kind of courage it takes to stand up for uh, these kids that need your help. <clears throat> if I could just, uh, I love what everyone said, and I would amplify, you know, this business is very much about relationships. You know, oftentimes, um, the most important thing is to run, and I'd hope that many of you who have not yet would consider doing that. There's the line, you've all heard it a million times, if you're not at the table, you're... 
Oh, yeah. Right, and that is just, people like that because it's so true and we understand that so acutely within our community. But you know, we're never gonna be a majority in any room, maybe besides this one, um, but certainly within a legislative body and it takes those relationships. And uh, I think some of you know that these jobs are not jobs, they're lifestyles, right? We work every day of the week, into the night, early mornings. That's often breakfast with colleagues who I don't agree with. But we're trying to develop the relationship so that when, in our Susan and I's case, we can't pass a bill without 41 votes. Now, you may know that we have a Democratic super, super, super majority at this point, so it's not quite as hard, but you know, it does get down to the wire sometimes. And then you start trading off of personal relationships, not in a corrupt way, but in a way that they now know you as a human being. And so that's a lot harder uh, to do. That takes a lot more investment of time. That may put you outside of your comfort zone, but you're gonna ask them to do the same. And so I think the longer I've been in elected office, this is my 10th year in elective office, I've come to understand just how critical relationships are. Uh, Mark was talking about uh, allies uh, and, and uh, affili affiliation. Uh, organized labor has been a long uh, time friend to our community. Um, but many of the bills that Susan and I offer in the legislature are co-authored not necessarily by just Equality California, but the ACLU, um, other kinds of groups who are allies who have a breadth and depth uh, that can sometimes bring more folks to the table um, that's really, really important. Um, and then lastly, I would just say that um, th we're in a democracy, or at least I think we still are. Um, <laughs> And it's, um, in progress is usually incremental, and I think that can be frustrating to those of us that are perfectionists, or those of us who've been waiting and craving for so long for power that we may uh, be a little bit impatient, um, but it is often incremental. And sometimes it's not as obvious, and I think that's maybe what Mark was getting to. Uh, I did a bill this year for transgender youth, uh, transgender foster youth and their access to health care. Uh, the bill was explicitly for these young people, um, people who often aren't heard from in legislatures, city halls, and uh, the Capitol. But there was the bill that it gives them the ability to see to seek proper health care didn't necessarily have to be gender specific. What we were talking about is making sure that foster care children in California have access to culturally competent health care. Now we called out trans youth, but we didn't have to do that. And even if implementing it without the specific trans reference, I think you still would have been able to go and fight for the right kind of health care. And so um, sometimes half a loaf and coming back to get the next half the next day uh, is the right approach. And sometimes you can get it uh, somewhat surreptitiously. And I only offer that because I know that not all of us are in a super, super, super majority in a deeply blue state that's immediately adjacent to a beautiful ocean. Um, sometimes you have to, uh, I'm just selling, I'm always selling. Tourism is a big part of our economy. Um, sometimes you have to get a more clever, but I would always count on our community to be the most clever, to figure out a way uh, to get it done. Susan, I would love to hear any strategies you have. Uh, I, it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's relationship, relationship, relationship. Um, and you know, we all don't just do LGBT bills. So one of the bills that I have worked on for two years, got it through two houses and to the governor's desk and he vetoed it, um, is uh, for around safe injection sites, right? Incredibly controversial, um, but important. And, and again, these kind of not LGBT issues, but we know that there are more LGBT, and especially transgender, um, people living on the streets who are addicted to drugs, right? And we know that it's important to keep them safe just one more day in order to get them into treatment. Um, and I passed that out of the legislature, which people couldn't believe, but with two votes from two Republicans, right? Even though Democrats have a supermajority, I did it with two Republicans, uh, and it's about that relationship and letting people know exactly who you are, and that's and that and, that, and that's how you build relationships. And because I think we tend to be perfectionists. When people know us, they trust us. And they trust us because they know, I may not agree with you 100%, but I know you've done your homework, and I know you're coming at this from a good place. And I think just those, those kinds of things. Our words are our bonds, uh, and I think we've always felt you know, the need to be even better. Um, and I think it's paid off, and I think the equality that we've seen ripple across the country. Now, California is the first state in the U.S. to pass an inclusive curriculum bill that highlights the historical contributions of LGBTQ people. Let's give it up for that. Um, and I have to say it is pretty amazing as a father who has children in the uh, um, California school district. They j have just started using the new curriculum this past fall, which is pretty amazing. So how did California voters respond to the inclusive curriculum legislation when first introduced? And walk us through how it was passed. And that would be something for all of you. Well, it, pa it didn't pass on the ballot. It passed through the legislature. So that was in 2011, um, and it was uh, Senator Mark Leno, as I recall, uh, who passed that. Um, 
and then it was it was just implemented this year, I believe, was the first year it was implemented. Uh, and it was both, and again, I think names are important, right? Names are nice, because I don't think we call it uh, gay inclusion in curriculum. It's, what is it, like health and beauty for all? What, what's the name of it? <laughs> but it's like fair education. Yeah. It's, it's got a, a, a lovely sounding name. Um, but I think, how did the voters respond to it? I mean, I think you see, we picked up seven congressional seats and swept everything. So I think voters liked it. Yeah. I would just love to hear from all you your perspective well, on it. This, uh, this is something that happened in the state legislature. I was still in the community college board in 2000, uh, 2011. So, um, uh, but it does strike me that it, it's still relatively a, a, a recent law and it still has to go through, I mean, what goes into textbooks, I'm not sure to the extent of what the law says has to be done. So often the devil is in the implementation details, right? And so you've got all these school districts around the state of California that still have to deal with this law. Uh, and I'm not sure what the textbook companies are required to do, uh, but it could be very influential because uh, California is a huge part of the textbook market, so it, it could affect what gets taught uh, in other parts of the country, right, uh, Susan? Co uh, yeah, correct, and it was, um, and it says you, we must teach about the history of, and we may not, you may not discriminate against. So it was, it was kind of a two-part, and I think it wasn't uh, mandated to be in the curriculums until 2015, and then it's fully adopted it was this year was the first year it was fully So I'd, uh, I'd be interested in what the state school board and the superintendent well, have to say they, about they textbook a, adoption. Yeah. They were part of the implementation, but I will say too, there were two attempts to repeal it and neither one of them even made it to the ballot. Here's what I find interesting is that our ability to uh, uh, pass legislation like this goes almost without notice anymore. It's almost routine. That may be, be because uh, there are so few Republicans left in California, they're really just white noise. And so we can really push forward a, a, a progressive agenda without r significant uh, pushback. And I would imagine at the legislature, you probably had that, those, that family values guy who comes to all the hearings and complains that the world will come to an end. And I think it did. I think it came to an end for a few minutes, um, but we got better. But, uh, but that's, that's kind of the way... Um, the, the legislation seems to go on LGBTQ uh, uh, Sacramento. We don't have that sort of battle that we had 25 years ago. I, I think Jeff's right. I mean, the, the, the progress, I even saw this on the local level when I was on the city council, the annual uh, LGBT pride resolution, you know, just a, hey, we're having pride this weekend, come on down and have, a, uh, you know, bring your, bring your whoever with you. Um, the, that would always be protested, always. Uh, and then by the end of my time on the city council, I served from 08 to, uh, to 2016, they didn't show up anymore. Um, and I think that's a lot of what we have worked so hard to kind of to normalize and to show this like it is everything. The, the St. Patrick's Day parade is treated the same as the LGBT pride parade. So there's that. What I just wanted to add on to this legislation you're asking about is that this is now, we see it being replicated by other communities that are also asserting their voice of being, wanting to be presented in the curriculum and whether that's the API community, uh, the Latino community and others, we're seeing similar bills really uh, uh, tearing off of what we have pioneered. And I, I think that we can all take pride in that, right? That, that we are once again blazing a trail in what may not be as prominent a way, may goes a little bit under the radar, um, but I know what it would have been to me uh, to sit in a classroom and read about people who blaze the trail um, who are otherwise overlooked, right? I, I remember vividly in uh, high school being told by a, uh, the teacher that there were two things you couldn't be if you ever wanted to be an elected official. Number one was gay. Number two, I don't remember because I was shocked. Um, <laughs> And the only reason I wasn't devastated at that time, I was shocked but not devastated, was I knew who Chris Kehoe was. I knew that Chris Kehoe had just been elected my city councilwoman, and I knew he was wrong. Um, but that was, not every community has a Chris Kehoe, right? And so these books are important, this curriculum is important, and I think it's true not just for LGBT youth, but for youth of color, uh, for youth with um, uh, you know, undocumented status, list goes on and on. They need to see themselves reflected in the history in order to feel like they're full partners in this country of ours. Agreed 100%. And you brought up the point, the fact that there are other states that are copying what has now been passed. You know, California law often becomes national models that other states seek to emulate and pass in their own state legislature. Are there any examples of equality legislation passed in California that are becoming models for other states outside of the curriculum? 
I think there's a bunch. I'm going to ask Susan to help me on this, but I think in the, the transgender foster youth bill um, is the first in the nation. I really hope it's not the last. I expect it won't be the last. It's really important that these young people who are wards of the state, our collective responsibility, we are their, their keeper, um, get the, uh, the full fair access uh, to healthcare that sets them up for a lifetime of hopefully success. Uh, we passed, we weren't the first, but we're one of the first to modernize our HIV laws. I did that bill with Senator Scott Weiner. Um, it was a difficult bill, um, but we passed it. Again, based off of relationships. Again, that was not necessarily one that uh, Democrats were of a uh, single mind on. Um, but it's really important uh, to help uh, reduce transmission rates to modernize these laws so that it's not uh, something that stigmatizes uh, testing. Um, those are two that come to mind right away. Susan, yeah, there, there are probably a few others. I think th those are some of the, um, I think the HIV decriminalization, um, single-use bathrooms, and a lot we've done around, around the uh, transgender, um, binary, um, uh, genders now you can do on your uh, your driver's license. It's easier to change your birth certificate if you want to. We've just made uh, we've made a lot of things a lot easier. Uh, gay panic you can't use that as a defense anymore. I think that's again something. Uh, trans panic you can't use that as a defense. Um, Looking back, there were a number of policies that began in California. I think West Hollywood was the first city to enact a domestic partner registration when they became a city in 1984. Um, we created in West Hollywood the first uh, transgender uh, uh, rights ordinance and the very first transgender advisory panel, the first government body that was uh, appointed to represent interest to the transgender community. But also in LA County, we've adopted other, a model ordinance dealing with issues of lewd conduct. Um, as well as uh, uh, transgender enforcement issues for the, uh, for the LAPD. Um, these are things that can be done at the local level, particularly when you have a progressive constituency, and uh, the, the, they've, they've been emulated throughout uh, jurisdictions, first throughout California, and we are seeing them uh, uh, adopted nationwide. Well, of course, the famous line about the states being laboratories of democracy uh, we see states like California uh, moving forward with experiments. Um, it seems awfully strange to call a comprehensive LGBT civil rights legislation an experiment. Uh, it seems that it, it really is uh, just including uh, everyone in what ought to have been in the first place. But um, what I'm excited about is in the Congress, uh, we have an ability, to, we have the possibility of catching up to California by passing what Nancy Pelosi has said is going to be a high priority, uh, which is the uh, LGBT um, Equality Act in Congress. So, um, and it, 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 it amends not just it, so many different parts of, of federal code. And, um, I'm going to feel very privileged to be on the one of the committees, one of the committees of jurisdiction, which is the Education and Workforce Committee, the subcommittee on workforce protection. Which, of course, the Equality Act, a big part of it is is workplace protections, non-discrimination in the workplace. And we used to be focused on uh, ENDA, which was the Employment Non-Discrimination uh, uh, Act. Um, but now, uh, you know, the uh, the conservatives have really pushed us to a place where they've reinterpreted RIFRA, uh, uh, the religious, uh, what was that, what's the acronym? Religious, uh, something freedom, RIFRA. Well, you know, the Hobby Lobby case and all that made us uh, much more fearful that the courts would interpret uh, uh, the law in such a way that if we had carve-outs and exceptions in, in ENDA, that it would become meaningless to pass this legislation. So we said, no, we've got to just pass a straight out civil rights legislation that, that guarantees LGBT people the same rights as everybody else. And that's going to be, I, I, I'm hopeful. And I, be, I believe that will, I believe in the House of Representatives, this will pass. Getting it through the Senate and signed by the president, another, another, another thing. But this, but California has led the way. Yeah. California has led the way in setting the bar. Um, but you know what? What's hopeful is that even in this, even in the current House of Representatives, as conservative as it is, it rejected discrimination against trans people uh, in the Department of Defense. 
It's this administration that's gone against the will of even this House of Representatives. Can you imagine that? Just, um, you know, just amazing. So I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that we're going to move the ball forward in the House and, you know, my hat's off to my own home state for, and my colleagues in, in the state legislature for just moving fearlessly ahead. Um, Susan and Todd, I have a question for you. Openly LGBTQA Assembly member Evan Lowe dropped his effort to pass a bill declaring gay conversion, conversion therapy a fraudulent practice. He said he needs more time to craft a national model that can be copied in other state legislatures. Tell me about the bill and what obstacles um, he ran into and any lessons that were learned. Um. Who else knows this song if you're over 50? You gotta know when to hold them. <laughs> know when, when to, to fold them. <laughs> nope. Right. I'm not Walk over 50 away. and I know okay. it. <laughs> a little sing along. Don't run. Um, that, so, uh, I, I think when you look at, I think when you are doing legislation that is really cutting edge, you have to anticipate that you might be sued. And if you anticipate something might go to court, then you have to look at the makeup of the court system. And it's 2018, almost 19, so we know what uh, things are looking like. And we know that we have a lot, we have, we have won a lot of other things. And we know that sometimes if we push that envelope at the wrong time, we can undo not only what we were trying to do, but other things can get caught up in that as well. So um, I think that is a kind of an evasive way to answer the question that um, the timing wasn't right, but I think people get the, I mean. Well, and if I can pile on, you know what, we, we have, by the way, I like Islands in the Stream better. Is that okay? <laughs> um, just if we're picking Kenny Rogers songs. Because um, it's Dolly, right? Because it's Dolly, we all love her. Um, when we have our LGBT caucus, we, we do a breakfast, a brunch nearly. Um, we show up, we talk. It's, it's, it's serious and lighthearted um, at the same time. And we sit in that room and we recognize that it may be eight of us, but we understand that the rest of the nation is really looking to us and really counting on us to put forward stuff because what we're doing here in California inevitably will go elsewhere in the country. So we got to get it right. And um, I think we feel that pressure uh, when we try and do big and bold things, um, whether it be HIV modernization. We were, I think, the third state to do it, but you know, there's last I checked 50, so we got a ways to go and we got to get it right. And so on this particular issue that so many of us understand how uh, terrible the practice is, uh, you know, this isn't just the 40 million people in California. This ultimately would be the 350 million people uh, who are in this country. So um, that pressure weighs on us, and I hope that all of you understand that, um, and uh, we'll work through it. I, I applaud Evan Lowe. Um, those in California, in bright blue California, you know, some of us went and sat with him when he was presenting the bill because they were bussing in opponents to by the but hundreds of people coming up and repeat one after another we are against this we do not support this we do not want this um, and that message is pretty toxic for every kid who's watching this on television right so Evan showed extreme uh, courage uh, to bring this bill forward I think getting it done perfectly and he also is a perfectionist um, is important and we're doing it again mindful not just of California but the rest of the nation and if I can just maybe to add tack one more thing onto that it isn't just about pioneering legislation, but it's also about pioneering leadership. And I want to point out that our ability to move this agenda is directly related to our state Senate president pro tem, Tony Atkins. Um, you, can you can draw a straight line, pun not intended, uh, between Christine Kehoe, who was our first, uh, who was our Harvey Milk in San Diego, Tony Atkins followed her on the city council and then in the legislature. Uh, I've had the honor of following Tony in her career. But Tony is now the state senate president pro tem. And I recognize no one here knows what a pro tem is. I barely do. But what it means is she's the head of the senate. And really in California, there's three people that really run the state. It's the governor, the speaker, and the pro tem. And the fact that the pro tem is a woman from a working class family from rural Virginia uh, who is an out and proud lesbian, who is an activist at her core with our values. Uh, when she's in that room making big decisions, uh, she's one of us. 
And so when Susan and I propose these bills, one of the things I know is that at the end of the day, we're going to be successful because Tony Atkins is in that seat. And so for all of you who've gained elected office, that's fantastic. But don't hang back. Get that next job, which is, by the way, harder to get, right? When you get, it's one thing to get elected by 150,000 people uh, in your district. It's a little bit harder when you're voted on by all your colleagues, everyone who thinks they can do the job better than you. Um, but Tony's gotten that done. She's only the third person in history of our state who has served both as a speaker and as the Senate President Pro Tem. And I I'll tell you that over the next number of years, as we continue to lead in California with legislation, it will be because Tony Atkins is in that seat. So I hope that all of you will keep her in your thoughts and prayers because she's a phenomenal leader. Agreed. Well, you brought me to my final point. Democrats now hold an extraordinary large majority in the state legislature and a liberal governor, Gavin Newsom, please give it up for Gavin, um, is in the governor's mansion. So I just want to know from each of you for your closing thought, What's next for California that people can be inspired by? I'm uh, happy, happy to start. So, I, but before I start, I did want to uh, say that now that I'm receiving all these, this mail from AARP, I was rather amused by the congressman member calling me a twink. <laughs> but I at, least appre I at least appreciate you putting the word hot in front of it. So, uh, the, um, so California, I, I think I want to, embellish what, uh, what Todd just said about leadership. California has the opportunity to provide leadership. And an important element of leadership, at least that I think speaks to this conference that we have here, um, to use a business term, is succession planning. You know, it's really easy to get excited about Senator Tammy Baldwin and Kristen Sinema. But the local recorder of deeds is just as important because that's our farm team. And all of us as elected officials need to be looking about who's going to replace us. Who are the people from the, the, the community? What type of tools can we give them now that we have this broad amount of authority and power in the state of California to appoint people to boards and commissions where they can learn about governance and working on a, uh, on a committee to help prepare a resume so that they could be the ones who will run for office after us and to create the infrastructure that's necessary to sustain our agenda, to make sure that all the things that we missed with our major legislation get cleaned up, and to ensure that there's going to be a healthy and, and broad base of folks who could take our places in generations to come. What's next? I want to hear from each of you. Well, I think, Jeff, that's a really good point about, I, I, I worry a lot about leadership development. I think what the Victory Institute does uh, by taking a class of, of promising leaders and take them through leadership development is really important. I think a, a number of other organizations do that. But that's incredibly important that we mentor promising young people because governing is a serious, is a serious activity and we need serious people um, to do it. Um, I think it's very clear when we don't have a serious person who succeeds. Uh, and I, you know who I'm referring to, don't you? I mean, uh, uh, I mean, Barack Obama kept saying all through the whole election, I, I refuse to believe that, you know, a real, no offense to reality. I mean, you're one of the better reality show yeah. people, but, but, but. Uh, DJ Trump and I are two different people, so it's all right, you're, you're okay. So, um, that's an example of somebody who is an extreme amateur and very unserious um, attaining the heights of power. And, and that, that's a huge, a huge thing we must have to avoid. But I think what California, along with Hawaii, uh, is the promise of is, is to demonstrate to the rest of the nation that a multicultural society where no one is in the majority uh, where we have many voices at the table, including LGBTQ voices, is not something to be afraid of. And that California is a strong, vibrant economy. And so not only is its government innovative, um, but its people are strong and its society is strong. And that uh, what's next for California is to continue to demonstrate to the rest of the nation that you know a nation that's not based on nationality. So the nation state is this idea of a common language, a common religion, a common race. 
is what roots that national identity. But what is nationalism, real nationalism for Americans? Is this idea that e pluribus unum, out of many, one, right? And so California, I think, is the best exemplar, can, could be the best exemplar of a place where, and that's, it's interesting that we're the place that seems to have the strongest reaction to who's in the White House. And I think what California is, is the preserver of the ideals of our country. So that's what's next. We are, we are the place that, uh, uh, that is clinging and holding fast the idea of a government of the people, for the people, and by the people that will not perish from this earth because we live it. We, we live the republic, the ideals of the republic every day. Yes. Susan? Yes. I, I think I would echo those, those same things, that we, uh, as you call it, a social laboratory, that we are the most diverse, and we remain the fifth largest economy in the world, right? So it is working despite our differences. It's not in spite of, it is because we are so diverse that we are able to be, um, that, that it's able to work so well. Uh, and, and I think it's just the continuation of the succession planning. I was the first one there is now uh, elected in my area. There is now a school board member, a city council member, and our, our state senator is able, able to come out. Because uh, I think it's going to be very unsexy what we're going to be working on this next year. is going to be homelessness, wildfires, um, health care, and probably pensions. Uh, those are some of the really big things that still face us. And they're not specifically LGBT, but they certainly are because we are all impacted by the same things. And I think that, you know, the more we embrace our, our common humanity, the more success we have across the nation. Um, yes. Susan Eggman, everybody. Um, I mean, I do think it revolves around leadership. Obviously, we're at this conference, and we believe in that. You, it was mentioned earlier, uh, Ricardo Lara was the first uh, LGBT person elected statewide in California. Uh, he's now our insurance commissioner. He's going to be phenomenal, uh, but he can't be the last, right? And I'm willing to wager that maybe some of those hands that were raised um, might somewhere in the future be the next one to punch through, whether that's a lieutenant governor or governor or senator. Um, we just have to keep pushing the bar because it's not just the legislation, it's also the leadership. Uh, in terms of what we will be doing, you know, I I think you should look to us for more uh, groundbreaking stuff, working with our friends at Equality California. I can see us you know, working to implement some of the things that we were talking about before, making sure those textbooks uh, are good. I'm pretty sure they're good. Um, dealing with more complex issues, uh, implementation. We want, how about being the first state that ends transmission of HIV uh, through our getting to zero efforts? <laughs> what, dealing with complex and controversial things like trans folks in prison. How do we treat those folks and how do we do better by them? What do we do? I represent a border district. We have a lot of our community members down at the border right now who are, who are we need to integrate somehow. Uh, they have a legal ability to come into this country and we have to tr do right by them because they are fleeing uh, difficult situations because of who, what they are. And we, they, they are us, they are our family, right? So there's a lot of stuff that we'll be pioneering here. I hope you all will continue to look to California uh, for leadership. And the last thing in terms of what the future looks like, uh, you don't need to be filming in Georgia. We have tax credits in California <laughs> and you should be filming Queer Eye in California, everybody. Done! <laughs> Bakersfield, here we come. First of all, thank you so much. Give it up for our panel. We appreciate them so much. And thank you all for joining us today.